Section 41. The Salvation Army. Structure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Hirsch. The Position of Our Forces, October 1890. Corps or Outposts, Officers or Persons, Societies Wholly Engaged in the Work. The United Kingdom, 1,375 Corps, 0 Officers, 4,506 Societies. France, Switzerland, 106 Corps, 72 Officers, 352 Societies. Sweden, 103 Corps, 41 Officers, 328 Societies. United States, 363 Corps, 57 Officers, 1,066 Societies. Canada, 317 Corps, 78 Officers, 1,021 Societies. Australia, Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales, Tasmania, Queensland, 270 Corps, 465 Officers, 903 Societies. New Zealand, 65 Corps, 99 Officers, 186 Societies. India, Ceylon, 80 Corps, 51 Officers, 419 Societies. Holland, 40 Corps, 8 Officers, 131 Societies. Denmark, 33 Corps, 0 Officers, 87 Societies. Norway, 45 Corps, 7 Officers, 132 Societies. Germany, 16 Corps, 6 Officers, 75 Societies. Belgium, 4 Corps, 0 Officers, 21 Societies. Finland, 3 Corps, 0 Officers, 12 Societies. The Argentine Republic, 2 Corps, 0 Officers, 15 Societies. South Africa and St. Helena, 52 Corps, 12 Officers, 162 Societies. Total abroad, 1499 Corps, 896 Officers, 4910 Societies. Grand total, 2,874 Corps, 896 Officers, 9,416 Societies. The Supply, Trade Department, at home and abroad. Buildings occupied, 8 at home, 22 abroad. Officers, 53 at home, 15 abroad. Employees, 207 at home. 55 abroad. Total, 260 at home, 70 abroad. The Property Department. Property now vested in the Army. The United Kingdom, 377,500 pounds. France and Switzerland, 10,000 pounds. Sweden, 13,598 pounds. Norway, 11,676 pounds. The United States, 6,601 pounds. Canada, 98,728 pounds. Australia, 86,251 pounds. New Zealand, 14,798 pounds. India, 5,537 pounds. Holland, 7,188 pounds. Denmark, 2,340 pounds. South Africa, 10,401 pounds. Total, 644,618 pounds. Value of trade effects, stock, machinery, and goods on hand, 130,000 pounds additional. Social work of the Army. Rescue homes for fallen women, 33. Slum posts, 33. Prison gate brigades, 10. Food depots, 4. Shelters for the destitute, 5. Inebriates home, 1. Factory for the out of work, 1. Labor Bureau, 2. Officers and other managing those branches, 384. Salvation and social reform literature, at home, abroad, and circulation. Weekly newspapers, 3 at home, 24 abroad, 31 million circulation. Monthly magazines, 3 at home, 12 abroad, 2,400,000 circulation. 
Total, six at home, 36 abroad, 33,400,000 circulation. Total annual circulation of the above, 33,400,000. Total annual circulation of other publications, 4 million. Total annual circulation of Army literature, 37,400,000. The United Kingdom, The War Cry, 300,000 weekly. The Young Soldier, 126,750 weekly. All the World, 50,000 monthly. The Deliverer, 48,000 monthly. General Statements and Statistics. Accommodation Annual Cost. Training Garrisons for Officers. United Kingdom, 28, 11,500 pounds. Abroad, 38, 760 pounds. Large vans for evangelizing the villages, known as cavalry forts. Homes of rest for officers, 24, 240, 10,000. Indoor meetings held weekly, 28,351. Open air meetings held weekly, chiefly in England and colonies, 21,467. Total meetings held weekly, 49,818. Number of houses visited weekly, Great Britain only, 54,000. Number of countries and colonies occupied, unknown. Number of languages in which literature is issued, 15. Number of languages in which salvation is preached by the officers, 29. Number of local, non-commissioned officers and bandsmen, 23,069. Number of scribes and office employees, 471. Average weekly reception of telegrams, 600. And letters, 5,400 at the London headquarters. Some raised annually from all sources by the Army, 750,000 pounds. Balance sheets, duly audited by chartered accountants, are issued annually in connection with the International Headquarters. See the Annual Report of 1889, Apostolic Warfare. Balance sheets are also produced quarterly at every corps in the world, audited and signed by the local officers. Divisional balance sheets issued monthly and audited by a special department at headquarters. Duly and independently audited balance sheets are also issued annually from every territorial headquarters. The Auxiliary League 1. Of persons who, without necessarily endorsing or approving of every single method used by the Salvation Army, are sufficiently in sympathy with its great work of reclaiming drunkards, rescuing the fallen, in a word saving the lost, as to give it their prayers, influence, and money. 2. Of persons who, although seeing eye to eye with the army, yet are unable to join it, owing to being actively engaged in the work of their own denominations, or by reason of bad health or other infirmities, which forbid their taking any active part in Christian work. Persons are enrolled either as subscribing or collecting auxiliaries. The League comprises persons of influence and position, members of nearly all denominations, and many ministers. Pamphlets, auxiliaries, will always be supplied gratis with copies of our annual report and balance sheet and other pamphlets for distribution on application to headquarters. Some of our auxiliaries have materially helped us in this way by distributing our literature at the seaside and elsewhere and by making arrangements for the regular supply of waiting rooms, hydropathics, and hotels, thus helping to dispel the prejudice under which many persons unacquainted with the army are found to labor. All the world posted free regularly each month to auxiliaries. For further information and for full particulars of the work of the Salvation Army, apply personally or by letter to General Booth, or to the Financial Secretary at International Headquarters, 101 Queen Victoria Street, London, E.C., to whom also contributions should be sent. Checks and postal orders crossed City Bank.
End of section 41. Recording by Tom Hirsch. Section 42. The Salvation Army. A Sketch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Hirsch. By an officer of seventeen years standing. What is the Salvation Army? It is an organization existing to effect a radical revolution in the spiritual condition of the enormous majority of the people of all lands. Its aim is to produce a change not only in the opinions, feelings, and principles of these vast populations, but to alter the whole course of their lives, so that instead of spending their time in frivolity and pleasure-seeking, if not in the grossest forms of vice, they shall spend it in the service of their generation and in the worship of God. So far, it has mainly operated in professedly Christian countries, where the overwhelming majority of the people have ceased, publicly at any rate, to worship Jesus Christ, or to submit themselves in any way to his authority. To what extent has the army succeeded? Its flag is now flying in 34 countries or colonies, where under the leadership of nearly 10,000 men and women, whose lives are entirely given up to the work, it is holding some 49,800 religious meetings every week, attended by millions of persons who ten years ago would have laughed at the idea of praying. And these operations are but the means for further extension, as will be seen, especially when it is remembered that the Army has its 27 weekly newspapers, of which no less than 31 million copies are sold in the streets, public houses, and popular resorts of the godless majority. From its ranks it is, therefore, certain that an ever-increasing multitude of men and women must eventually be won that all this has not amounted to the creation of a mere passing gust of feeling may best be demonstrated perhaps from the fact that the army has accumulated no less than seven hundred seventy five thousand pounds worth of property pays rentals amounting to two hundred twenty thousand pounds per annum for its meeting places and has a total income from all sources of three quarters of a million per annum now, consider from whence all this has sprung. It is only twenty-five years since the author of this volume stood absolutely alone in the east of London to endeavor to Christianize its irreligious multitudes without the remotest conception in his own mind of the possibility of any such organization being created. Consider, moreover, through what opposition the Salvation Army has ever had to make its way. In each country it has to face universal prejudice, distrust, and contempt, and often stronger antipathy still. This opposition has generally found expression in systematic, governmental, and police restriction, followed in too many cases by imprisonment and by the condemnatory outpourings of bishops, clergy, pressmen, and others, naturally followed in too many instances by the oaths and curses, the blows and insults of the populace. Through all this, in country after country, the army makes its way to the position of universal respect. That respect, at any rate, which is shown to those who have conquered. And of what material has this conquering host been made? Wherever the army goes, it gathers into its meetings, in the first instance, a crowd of the most debased, brutal, blasphemous elements that can be found, who, if permitted, interrupt the services, and, if they see the slightest sign of police tolerance for their misconduct, frequently fall upon the army officers or their property with violence. Yet a couple of officers face such an audience with the absolute certainty of recruiting out of it an army corps. 
many thousands of those who are now most prominent in the ranks of the army never knew what it was to pray before they attended its services and large numbers of them had settled into profound conviction that everything connected with religion was utterly false it is out of such material that god has constructed what is admitted to be one of the most fervid bodies of believers ever seen on the face of the earth many persons in looking at the progress of the army have shown a strange want of discernment in talking and writing as though all this had been done in a most haphazard fashion or as though an individual could by the mere effort of his will produce such changes in the lives of others as he chose the slightest reflection will be sufficient we are sure to convince any impartial individual that the gigantic results attained by the salvation army could only be reached by steady unaltering processes adapted to this end and what are the processes by which this great army has been made first the foundation of all the army's success looked at apart from its divine source of strength is its continued direct attack upon those whom it seeks to bring under the influence of the gospel the salvation army officer instead of standing upon some dignified pedestal to describe the fallen condition of his fellow men in the hope that though far from him they may thus by some mysterious process come to a better life goes down into the street and from door to door and from room to room lays his hands on those who are spiritually sick and leads them to the almighty healer in its forms of speech and writing the army constantly exhibits this same characteristic instead of propounding religious theories or pretending to teach a system of theology it speaks much after the fashion of the old prophet or apostle to each individual about his or her sin and duty thus bringing to bear upon each heart and conscience the light and power from heaven by which alone the world can be transformed second and step by step along with this human contact goes unmistakably something that is not human the puzzlement and self-contradiction of most critics of the army springs undoubtedly from the fact that they are bound to account for its success without admitting that any superhuman power attends its ministry yet day after day and night after night the wonderful facts go on multiplying the man who last night was drunk in a london slum is tonight standing up for christ on an army platform the clever skeptic who a few weeks ago was interrupting the speakers in berlin and pouring contempt upon their claims to a personal knowledge of the unseen saviour is today as thorough a believer as any of them the poor girl lost to shame and hope who a month ago was an outcast of paris is today a modest devoted follower of christ working in a humble situation to those who admit we are right in saying this is the lord's doing all is simple enough and our certainty that the dregs of society can become its ornaments requires no further explanation third all these modern miracles would however have been comparatively useless but for the army's system of utilizing the gifts and energies of our converts to the uttermost suppose that without any claim to divine power the army had succeeded in raising up tens of thousands of persons formerly unknown and unseen in the community and made them into singers speakers musicians and orderlies that would surely in itself have been a remarkable fact but not only have these engaged in various labors for the benefit of the community 
they have been filled with a burning ambition to attain the highest possible degree of usefulness. No one can wonder that we expect to see the same process carried on successfully amongst our new friends of the casual ward and the slum. And if the army has been able to accomplish all this utilization of human talents for the highest purposes, in spite of an almost universally prevailing contrary practice among the churches, what may not its social wing be expected to do with the example of the army before it? Fourth, the maintenance of all this system has, of course, been largely due to the unqualified acceptance of military government and discipline. But for this, we cannot be blind to the fact that, even in our own ranks, Difficulties would every day arise as to the exaltation to front seats of those who were formerly persecutors and injurious. The old feeling which would have kept Paul suspected in the background after his conversion is, unfortunately, a part of the conservative groundwork of human nature that continues to exist everywhere and which has to be overcome by rigid discipline in order to secure that everywhere and always the new converts should be made the most of for Christ. But our army system is a great, indisputable fact, so much so that our enemies sometimes reproach us with it, that it should be possible to create an army organization, and to secure faithfully execution of duty daily is indeed a wonder but a wonder accomplished, just as completely amongst the Republicans of America and France as amongst the militarily trained Germans or the subjects of the British monarchy. It is notorious that we can send an officer from London, possessed of no extraordinary ability, to take command of any corps in the world, with a certainty that he will find soldiers eager to do his bidding, and without a thought of disputing his commands, so long as he continues faithful to the orders and regulations under which his men are enlisted. Fifth, but those show a curious ignorance who set down our successes to this discipline as though it were something of the prison order, although enforced without any of the power lying either behind the prison warder or the Catholic priest. On the contrary, wherever the discipline of the army has been endangered, and its regular success for a time interrupted, it has been through an attempt to enforce it without enough of that joyous, cheerful spirit of love which is its main spring. Nobody can become acquainted with our soldiers in any land without being almost immediately struck with their extraordinary gladness. And this joy is in itself one of the most infectious and influential elements of the army's success. But if this be so, amid the comparatively well-to-do, judge of what its results are likely to be amongst the poorest and most wretched. To those who have never known bright days, the mere sight of a happy face is, as it were, a revelation and inspiration in one. Sixth, but the army's success does not come with magical rapidity. It depends, like that of all real work, upon infinite perseverance. To say nothing of the perseverance of the officer who has made the saving of men his life work, and who, occupied and absorbed with this great pursuit, may naturally enough be expected to remain faithful. There are multitudes of our soldiers who, after a hard day's toil for their daily bread, have but a few hours of leisure, but devote it ungrudgingly to the service of the war. Again and again, when the remains of some soldier are laid to rest, amid the almost universal respect of a town which once knew him only as an evildoer, we hear it said that this man, since the date of his conversion from five to ten years ago, has seldom been absent from his post, and never without good reason for it. 
his duty may have been comparatively insignificant. Only a door opener. Only a war cry seller. Yet Sunday after Sunday, evening after evening, he would be present, no matter who the commanding officer might be, to do his part, bearing with the unruly, breathing hope into the distressed, and showing unwavering faithfulness to all. The continuance of these processes of mercy depends largely upon leadership, and the creation and maintenance of this leadership has been one of the marvels of the movement. We have men today looked up to and reverenced over wide areas of country, arousing multitudes to the most devoted service, who a few years ago were champions of iniquity, notorious in nearly every form of vice, and some of them ringleaders, in violent opposition to the army. We have a right to believe that on the same lines God is going to raise up just such leaders without measure and without end. Beneath, behind, and pervading all the successes of the Salvation Army is a force against which the world may sneer, but without which the world's miseries cannot be removed. The force of that divine love which breathed on Calvary and which God is able to communicate by His Spirit to human hearts today. It is pitiful to see intelligent men attempting to account, without the admission of this great fact, for the self-sacrifice and success of salvation officers and soldiers. If those who wish to understand the army would only take the trouble to spend as much as twenty-four hours with its people, how different in almost every instance would be the conclusions arrived at. Half an hour spent in the rooms inhabited by many of our officers would be sufficient to convince even a well-to-do working man that life could not be lived happily in such circumstances without some superhuman power, which alike sustains and gladdens the soul altogether independently of earthly surroundings. The scheme that has been propounded in this volume would, we are quite satisfied, have no chance of success were it not for the fact that we have such a vast supply of men and women who, through the love of Christ ruling in their hearts, are prepared to look upon a life of self-sacrificing effort for the benefit of the vilest and roughest as the highest of privileges. With such a force at command, we dare to say that the accomplishment of this stupendous undertaking is a foregone conclusion if the material assistance which the army does not possess is forthcoming. End of section 42. Recording by Tom Hirsch. Section 43. The Salvation Army Social Reform Wing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Hirsch. The Plan for Creation of the Labor Bureau. Temporary Headquarters, 36 Upper Thames Street, London, E.C. Objects. The bringing together of employers and workers for their mutual advantage. Making known the wants of each to each by providing a ready method of communication plan of operation. The opening of a central registry office, which for the present will be located at the above address, and where registers will be kept, free of charge, wherein the wants of both employers and workers will be recorded, the registers being open for consultation by all interested. Public waiting rooms for male and female to which the unemployed may come for the purpose of scanning the newspapers, the insertion of advertisements for employment in all newspapers at lowest rates, writing tables, etc., provided for their use to enable them to write applications for situations on work, the receiving of letters, replies to applications for employment for unemployed workers. The waiting rooms will also act as houses of call, 
where employers can meet and enter into engagements with workers of all kinds, by appointment or otherwise, thus doing away with the snare that awaits many of the unemployed, who have no place to wait other than the public house, which at present is almost the only house of call for out-of-work men. By making known to the public generally the wants of the unemployed by means of advertisements, by circulars, and direct application to employers, the issue of labor statistics with information as to the number of unemployed who are anxious for work, the various trades and occupations they represent, etc., etc. The opening of branches of the Labor Bureau as fast as funds and opportunities permit, in all the large towns and centers of industry throughout Great Britain. In connection with the Labor Bureau, we propose to deal with both skilled and unskilled workers, amongst the latter forming such agencies as Sandwich Board Men's Society, Shoe Black, Carpet Beating, White Washing, Window Cleaning, Wood Chopping, and other brigades, all of which will, with many others, be put into operation as far as the assistance of the public, in the shape of applying for workers of all kinds, will afford us the opportunity. A domestic servants' agency will also be a branch of the Bureau, and a home for domestic servants out of situation is also in contemplation. In this and other matters, funds alone are required to commence operations. All communications, donations, etc., should be addressed as above, marked Labor Bureau, etc., Central Labor Bureau, Local Agents and Correspondence Department. Letter to Proposed Local Correspondent. Dear Comrade, the enclosed letter, which has been sent to our officers throughout the field, will explain the object we have in view. Your name has been suggested to us as one whose heart is thoroughly in sympathy with any effort on behalf of poor, suffering humanity. We are anxious to have in connection with each of our corps, and in every locality throughout the kingdom, some sympathetic, level-headed comrade acting as our agent or local correspondent, to whom we could refer at all times for reliable information, and who would take it as work of love to regularly communicate useful information respecting the social condition of things generally in their neighborhood kindly reply giving us your views and feelings on the subject as soon as possible as we are anxious to organize at once the first business on hand is for us to get information of those out of work and employers requiring workers so that we can place them upon our registers and make known the wants both of employers and employees we shall be glad of a communication from you, giving us some facts as to the condition of things in your locality, or any ideas or suggestions you would like to give, calculated to help us in connection with this good work. I may say that the social wing not only comprehends the labor question, but also prison rescue and other branches of salvation work dealing with broken-down humanity generally, so that you can see what a great blessing you may be to the work of God by cooperating with us. Believe me to be yours affectionately for the suffering and the lost, etc. Local Agents and Correspondence Department Proposition for a Local Agent, Correspondent, etc. Requesting Name, Address, Occupation, If a Soldier, What Corps, if not a soldier, what denomination? If spoken to on the subject, what reply they have made? Signed, core, dated. Kindly return this as soon as possible, and we will then place ourselves in communication with the comrade you propose for this position. To Employers of Labor Notice of Labor Bureau Local Office of Registration Opening we beg to bring to your notice the fact that the Salvation Army has opened at the above address, in connection with the Social Reform Wing, a labor bureau for the registration of the wants of all classes of labor, for both employer and employee in London and throughout the kingdom, our object being to place in communication with each other, for mutual advantage, 
those who want workers and those who want work. Arrangements have been made at the above address for waiting rooms, where employers can see unemployed men and women, and where the latter may have accommodation to write letters, see the advertisements in the papers, etc., etc. If you are in want of workers of any kind, will you kindly fill up the enclosed form and return it to us? We will then have the particulars entered up and endeavor to have your wants supplied. All applications, I need hardly assure you, will have our best attention, whether they refer to work of a permanent or temporary character. We shall also be glad, through the Information Office of Labor Department, to give you any further information as to our plans, etc., or an officer will wait upon you to receive instructions for the supply of workers, if requested. As no charge will be made for registration of either the wants of employers or the wants of the unemployed, it will be obvious that a considerable outlay will be necessary to sustain these operations in active usefulness, and that, therefore, financial help will be greatly needed. We shall gratefully receive donations from the smallest coin up to help to cover the cost of working this department. We think it right to say that only in special cases shall we feel at liberty to give personal recommendations. This, however, will no doubt be understood, seeing that we shall have to deal with very large numbers who are total strangers to us. Please address all communications or donations as above, marked Central Labor Bureau, etc. We propose to enter upon a crusade against sweating. Will you help us? Dear Sir, in connection with the Social Reform Wing, a Central Labor Bureau has been opened, one department of which will deal especially with that class of labor termed unskilled, from amongst whom are drawn boardmen, messengers, bill distributors, circular addressers, window cleaners, whitewashers, carpet beaters, etc., etc., it is very important that work given to these workers, and others not enumerated, should be taxed as little as possible by the contractor, or those who act between the employer and the worker. In all our operations in this capacity, we do not propose to make profit out of those we benefit. Paying over the whole amount received, less, say, one halfpenny in the shilling, or some such small sum which will go towards the expense of providing boards for sandwich boardmen, the hire of barrows, purchase of necessary tools, etc., etc. We are very anxious to help that most needy class, the boardmen, many of whom are sweated out of their miserable earnings, receiving often as low as one shilling for a day's toil. We appeal to all who sympathize with suffering humanity, especially religious and philanthropic individuals and societies, to assist us in our efforts by placing orders for the supply of boardmen, messengers, bill distributors, window cleaners, and other kinds of labor in our hands. Our charge for boardmen will be two shillings, twopence, including boards, the placing and proper supervision of the men, etc., Two shillings, at least, will go directly to the men. Most of the hirers of boardmen pay this, and some even more, but often not more than one-half reaches the men. We shall be glad to forward you further information of our plans, or we'll send a representative to further explain or to take orders on receiving notice from you to that effect. Believe me to be yours faithfully, etc. Central Labor Bureau, Notice to the Unemployed Male and Female A free registry for all kinds of unemployed labor has been opened at the above address. If you want work, call and make yourself and your wants known. Enter your name and address and wants on the registers, or fill up a form below and hand it in at above address. Look over the advertising pages of the papers provided. Tables with pens and ink are provided for you to write for situations. If you live at a distance, 
fill up this form giving all particulars or references and forward to commissioner smith care of the labor bureau requesting your name address kind of work wanted wages you ask age during the past ten years have you had regular employment for how long what kind of work what work can you do what have you worked at odd times how much did you earn when regularly employed how much did you earn when irregularly employed are you married is wife living how many children and their ages if you were put on a farm to work at anything you could do and were supplied with food lodging and clothes with a view to getting you on your feet would you do all you could End of section 43. Recording by Tom Hirsch. Section 44. How Beggary Was Abolished in Bavaria by Count Rumford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Hirsch. Count Rumford was an American officer who served with considerable distinction in the Revolutionary War in that country, and afterwards settled in England. From thence he went to Bavaria, where he was promoted to the chief command of its army, and also was energetically employed in the civil government. Bavaria, at this time, literally swarmed with beggars, who were not only an eyesore and discredit to the nation, but a positive injury to the state. The Count resolved upon the extinction of this miserable profession, and the following extracts from his writings describe the method by which he accomplished it. Bavaria, by the neglect of the government and the abuse of the kindness and charity of its amiable people, had become infested with beggars, with whom mingled vagabonds and thieves, they were to the body politic what parasites and vermin are to people and dwellings, breeding by the same lazy neglect. Page 14. In Bavaria there were laws which made provisions for the poor, but they suffered them to fall into neglect. Beggary had become general. Page 15. In short, says Count Rumford, these detestable vermin swarmed everywhere and not only their impudence and clamorous importunity were boundless, but they had recourse to the most diabolical arts and the most horrid crimes in the prosecution of their infamous trade. They exposed and tortured their own children, and those they stole for the purpose, to extort contributions from the charitable. Page 15. In the large towns, beggary was an organized imposture with a sort of government and police of its own. Each beggar had his beat, with orderly successions and promotions, as with other governments. There were battles to decide conflicting claims, and a good beat was not infrequently a marriage portion or a thumping legacy. Page 16. He saw that it was not enough to forbid beggary by law, or to punish it by imprisonment. The beggars cared for neither. The energetic Yankee statesman attacked the question as he did problems in physical science. He studied beggary and beggars. How would he deal with one individual beggar? Sent him for a month to prison to beg again as soon as he came out? That is no remedy. The evident course was to forbid him to beg, but at the same time to give him the opportunity to labor to teach him to work, to encourage him to honest industry, and the wise ruler sets himself to provide food, comfort, and work for every beggar and vagabond in Bavaria, and did it. Page 17. Count Rumford, wise and just, sets himself to reform the whole class of beggars and vagabonds, and convert them into useful citizens, even those who had sunk into vice and crime. What, he asked himself, is, after the necessities of life, the first condition of comfort. Cleanliness, which animals and insects prize, which in man affects his moral character, 
and which is akin to godliness. The idea that the soul is defiled and depraved by what is unclean has long prevailed in all ages. Virtue never dwelt long with filth. Our bodies are at war with everything that defiles them. His first step, after a thorough study and consideration of the subject, was to provide in Munich, and at all necessary points, large, airy, and even elegant houses of industry, and store them with the tools and materials of such manufactures as were most needed and would be most useful. Each house was provided with a large dining room and a cooking apparatus sufficient to furnish an economical dinner to every worker. Teachers were engaged for each kind of labor. Warmth, light, comfort, neatness, and order in and around these houses made them attractive. The dinner every day was gratis, provided at first by the government, later by the contributions of the citizens. Bakers brought stale bread, butchers refuse meat, citizens their broken victuals, all rejoicing in being freed from the nuisance of beggary. The teachers of handicrafts were provided by the government, and while all this was free, everyone was paid the full value for his labor. You shall not beg, but there is comfort, food, work, and pay. There was no ill usage, no harsh language. In five years, not a blow was given even to a child by his instructor. When the preparations for this great experiment had been silently completed, the army, the right arm of the governing power, which had been prepared for the work by its own thorough reformation, was called into action in aid of the police and the civil magistrates. Regiments of cavalry were so disposed as to furnish every town with a detachment, with patrols on every highway, and squads in the villages, keeping the strictest order and discipline, paying the utmost deference to the civil authorities, and avoiding all offense to the people. Instructed when the order was given to arrest every beggar, vagrant, and deserter, and bring them before the magistrates. This military police cost nothing extra to the country beyond a few cantonments, and this expense to the whole country was less than three thousand pounds a year. The first of January, seventeen ninety, New Year's Day, from time immemorial the beggar's holiday, when they swarmed in the streets expecting everyone to give, the commissioned and the non-commissioned officers of three regiments of infantry were distributed early in the morning at different points of Munich to wait for orders. Lieutenant General Count Rumford assembled at his residence the chief officers of the army and principal magistrates of the city, and communicated to them his plans for the campaign. Then, dressed in the uniform of his rank, with his orders and decorations glittering on his breast, setting an example to the humblest soldier, he led them into the street, and had scarcely reached it before a beggar approached, wishing him a happy new year, and waited for the expected aims. I went up to him, says Count Rumford, and laying my hand gently on his shoulder, told him that henceforth begging would not be permitted in Munich, that if he was in need, assistance would be given him, and if detected begging again, he would be severely punished. He was then sent to the town hall, his name and residence inscribed upon the register, and he was directed to repair to the military house of industry next morning, where he would find dinner, work, and wages. Every officer, every magistrate, every soldier followed the same example set them, Every beggar was arrested, and in one day a stop was put to beggary in Bavaria. It was banished out of the kingdom. And now let us see what was the progress and success of this experiment. It seemed a risk to trust the raw materials of industry, wool, flax, hemp, etc., to the hands of common beggars. To render debauched and depraved class orderly and useful was an arduous enterprise. 
Of course, the greater number made bad work at the beginning. For months they cost more than they came to. They spoiled more horns than they made spoons. Employed first in the coarser and ruder manufactures, they were advanced as they improved, and were for some time paid more than they earned. Paid to encourage good will, effort, and perseverance. These were worth any sum. The poor people saw that they were treated with more than justice, with kindness. It was very evident that it was all for their good. At first there was confusion, but no insubordination. They were awkward, but not insensible to kindness. The aged, the weak, and the children were put to the easiest tasks. The younger children were paid simply to look on until they begged to join in the work, which seemed to them like play. Everything around them was made clean, quiet, orderly, and pleasant. Living at their own homes, they came at a fixed hour in the morning. They had at noon a hot, nourishing dinner of soup and bread. Provisions were either contributed or bought wholesale, and the economies of cookery were carried to the last point of perfection. Count Rumford had so planned the cooking apparatus that three women cooked the dinner for one thousand persons at a cost, though wood was used, of four and one-half pennies for fuel, and the entire cost of the dinner for twelve hundred was only one pound seven shillings six and a half pence, or about one-third of a penny for each person. Perfect order was kept at work, at meals, and everywhere. As soon as a company took its place at table, the food having been previously served, all repeated a short prayer. Perhaps, says Count Rumford, I ought to ask pardon for mentioning so old-fashioned a custom, but I own I am old-fashioned enough myself to like such things. These poor people were generously paid for their labor, but something more than cash payment was necessary. There was needed a feeling of emulation, the desire to excel, the sense of honor, the love of glory. Not only pay, but rewards, prizes, distinctions were given to the more deserving. Peculiar care was taken with the children. They were first paid simply for being present, idle lookers-on, until they begged with tears to be allowed to work. How sweet those tears were to me, says Count Rumford, can easily be imagined. Certain hours were spent by them in a school for which teachers were provided. The effect of these measures was very remarkable. Awkward as the people were, they were not stupid, and learned to work with unexpected rapidity. More wonderful was the change in their manners, appearances, and the very expression of their countenances. Cheerfulness and gratitude replaced the gloom of misery and the sullenness of despair. Their hearts were softened. They were most grateful to their benefactor for themselves, still more for their children. These worked with their parents, forming little industrial groups, whose affection excited the interest of every visitor. Parents were happy in the industry and growing intelligence of their children, and the children were proud of their own achievements. The great experiment was a complete and triumphant success. When Count Rumford wrote his account of it, it had been five years in operation. It was financially a paying speculation, and had not only banished beggary, but had wrought an entire change in the manners, habits, and very appearance of the most abandoned and degraded people in the kingdom. Count Rumford, pages 18 through 24. Are the poor ungrateful? Count Rumford did not find them so. When, from the exhaustion of his great labors, he fell dangerously ill, these poor people whom he had rescued from lives of shame and misery spontaneously assembled, formed a procession, 
and went in a body to the cathedral to offer their united prayers for his recovery. When he was absent in Italy, and supposed to be dangerously ill in Naples, they set apart a certain time every day, after work hours, to pray for their benefactor. After an absence of fifteen months, Count Rumford returned with renewed health to Munich, a city where there was work for everyone, and not one person whose wants were not provided for. When he visited the military workhouse, the reception given him by these poor people drew tears from the eyes of all present. A few days after, he entertained eighteen hundred of them in the English garden, a festival at which thirty thousand of the citizens of Munich assisted. Count Rumford, pages twenty-four and twenty-five. End of section forty-four. Recording by Tom Hirsch. Section 45. The Cooperative Experiment at Rallaheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Hirsch. The Outrages of the Whitefeet, Lady Clareboys, and Terry Alts laborers far exceeded those of recent occurrence, yet no remedy but force was attempted, except by one Irish landlord. Mr. John Scott Vendelur of Rallaheim, County Clare, late High Sheriff of his county. Early in 1831, his family had been obliged to take flight in charge of an armed police force, and his steward had been murdered by one of the laborers, having been chosen by lot at a meeting held to decide who should perpetrate the deed. Mr. Vandeleur came to England to seek someone who would aid him in organizing the laborers into an agricultural and manufacturing association to be conducted on cooperative principles, and he was recommended to Mr. Craig, who, at great sacrifice of his position and prospects, consented to give his services. No one but a man of rare zeal and courage would have attempted so apparently hopeless a task as that which Mr. Craig undertook. Both the men whom he had to manage, the Terry Alts who had murdered their master's steward, and their surroundings were as little calculated to give confidence in the success of the scheme as they well could be. The men spoke generally the Irish language, which Mr. Craig did not understand, and they looked upon him with suspicion, as one sent to worm out of them the secret of the murder recently committed. He was consequently treated with coldness, and worse than that. On one occasion the outline of his grave was cut out of the pasture near his dwelling, and he carried his life in his hand. After a time, however, he won the confidence of these men, rendered savage as they had been by ill treatment. The farm was let by Mr. Vandeleur at a fixed rent, to be paid in fixed quantities of farm produce, which, at the prices ruling in 1830-31, would bring in 900 pounds, which included interest on buildings, machinery, and livestock provided by Mr. Vandeleur. The rent alone was 700 pounds. As the farm consisted of 618 acres, only 268 of which were under tillage, this rent was a very high one, a fact which was acknowledged by the landlord. All profits after payment of rent and interest belonged to the members, divisible at the end of the year if desired. They started a cooperative store to supply themselves with food and clothing, and the estate was managed by a committee of the members, who paid every male and female member wages for their labor in labor notes, which were exchangeable at the store for goods or cash. Intoxicating drink or tobacco were prohibited. The committee each day allotted each man his duties. The members worked the land partly as kitchen garden and fruit orchards, and partly as dairy farm stall feeding being encouraged and root crops grown for the cattle. Pigs, poultry, etc. were reared. Wages at the time were only eight pence per day for men and five pence for women, and the members were paid at these rates. Yet, 
as they lived chiefly on potatoes and milk produced on the farm, which, as well as mutton and pork, were sold to them at extremely low prices, they saved money, or rather notes. Their health and appearance quickly improved, so much so that with disease raging around them, there was no case of death or serious illness among them while the experiment lasted. The single men lived together in a large building and families in cottages. Assisted by Mrs. Craig, the secretary carried out the most enlightened system of education for the young, those old enough being alternately employed on the farm and in the school. Sanitary arrangements were in a high state of perfection, and physical and moral training were most carefully attended to. In respect of these and other social arrangements, Mr. Craig was a man much before his time, and he has since made himself a name in connection with their application in various parts of the country. The new system, as the Rallheim experiment was called, though at first regarded with suspicion and derision, quickly gained favor in the district, so that before long outsiders were extremely anxious to become members of the association. In January 1832, the community consisted of 50 adults and 17 children. The total number afterwards increased to 81. Everything was prosperous, and the members of the association were not only benefited themselves, but their improvement exercised a beneficent influence upon the people in their neighborhood. It was hoped that other landlords would imitate the excellent example of Mr. Vandeleur, especially as his experiment was one profitable to himself, as well as calculated to produce peace and contentment in disturbed Ireland. Just when these hopes were raised to their highest degree of expectancy, the happy community at Rallaheim was broken up through the ruin and flight of Mr. Vandeleur, who had lost his property by gambling. Everything was sold off, and the labor notes saved by the members would have been worthless had not Mr. Craig, with noble self-sacrifice, redeemed them out of his own pocket. We have given but a very scanty description of the system pursued at Rallaheim. The arrangements were in most respects admirable, and reflected the greatest credit upon Mr. Craig as an organizer and administrator. To his wisdom, energy, tact, and forbearance, the success of his experiment was in great measure due, and it is greatly to be regretted that he was not in a position to repeat the attempt under more favorable circumstances. History of a Cooperative Farm Carlyle on the Social Obligations of the Nation Forty-five years ago, inserted at the earnest request of a friend who was struck by the coincidence of some ideas similar to those of this volume, set forth so long ago, but as yet remaining unrealized and which I had never read. Extracts from Past and Present by Thomas Carlyle, 1843 a prime minister, even here in England, who shall dare believe the heavenly omens and address himself like a man and a hero to the great dumb struggling heart of England, and speak out for it, and act out for it, the God's justice it is writhing to get uttered and perishing for want of, yes, he too will see awaken round him a passionate, burning, all-defiant loyalty the heart of England, and such a support as no division list or parliamentary majority has ever yet known to yield a man. Here as there, now as then, he who can and dare trust the heavenly immensities, all earthly localities are subject to him. We will pray for such a man and first lord. Yes, and far better, we will strive and incessantly make ready, each of us, to be worthy to serve and second such a first lord. We shall then be as good as sure of his arriving, sure of many things, let him arrive or not. Who can despair of governments, that passes a soldier's guardhouse, or meets a red-coated man in the streets, 
that a body of men could be got together to kill other men when you bade them. This, a priori, does it not seem one of the impossiblest things? Yet look, behold it, in the stolidest of do-nothing governments, that impossibility is a thing done. Carlyle, Past and Present, page 223. Strange, interesting, and yet most mournful to reflect on. Was this, then, of all the things mankind had some talent for, the one thing important to learn well, and bring to perfection, this of successfully killing one another? Truly you have learned it well, and carried the business to a high perfection. It is incalculable what by arranging, commanding, and regimenting you can make of men. These thousand straight-standing, firm-set individuals, who shoulder arms, who march, wheel, advance, retreat, and are, for your behoof, a magazine charged with fiery death, in the most perfect condition of potential activity. Few months ago, till the persuasive sergeant came, what were they? Multiform ragged lozels, runaway apprentices, starved weavers, thievish valets, an entirely broken population, fast tending towards the treadmill. But the persuasive sergeant came, by tap of drum enlisted, or formed lists of them, took heartily to drilling them. And he and you have made them this, most potent, effectual for all work whatsoever, is wise planning, firm, combining, and commanding among men. Let no man despair of governments who looks on these two sentries at the horse guards and our united service clubs. I could conceive an emigration service, a teaching service, considerable varieties of united and separate services, of the due thousands strong, all effective as this fighting service is, all doing their work like it, which work, much more than fighting, is henceforth a necessity of these new ages we are got into. Much lies among us, convulsively, nigh desperately struggling to be born past and present, page 224. It was well all this we know, and yet it was not well. Forty soldiers, I am told, will disperse the largest Spitalfields mob. Forty to ten thousand. That is the proportion between drilled and undrilled. Much there is which cannot yet be organized in this world, but somewhat also which can, somewhat also which must. When one thinks, for example, what books are become and becoming for us, what operative Lancashires are become, what a fourth estate and in innumerable virtualities, not yet got to be actualities, are become and becoming. One sees organisms enough in the dim, huge future, and united services quite other than the redcoat one, and much, even in these years, struggling to be born. Past and Present, page 226. An effective teaching service I do consider that there must be. Some education secretary, captain general of teachers, who will actually contrive to get us taught. Then again, why should there not be an immigration service, and secretary with adjuncts, with funds, forces, idle navy ships, and ever-increasing apparatus, in fine and effective system of emigration, so that at length before our twenty years of respite ended, every honest willing workman who found England too straight, and the organization of labor not yet sufficiently advanced, might find likewise a bridge built to carry him into new western lands, there to organize with more elbow-room some labor for himself, there to be a real blessing, raising new corn for us, purchasing new webs and hatchets from us, leaving us at least in peace, instead of staying here to be physical force, chartist, unblessed, and no blessing. Is it not scandalous to consider that a prime minister could raise within the year, as I have seen it done, 
a hundred twenty million sterling to shoot the French, and we are stopped short for want of the hundredth part of that to keep the English living. The bodies of the English living and the souls of the English living, these two services, an education service and an emigration service, these with others, will have actually to be organized. A free bridge for emigrants. Why, we should then be on a par with America itself, the most favored of all lands that have no government. And we should have, besides, so many traditions and mementos of priceless things which America has cast away. We could proceed deliberately to organize labor not doomed to perish unless we effected it within year and day every willing worker that proved superfluous, finding a bridge ready for him. This verily will have to be done. The time is big with this. Our little isle is grown too narrow for us. But the world is wide enough yet for another six thousand years. England's sure markets will be among new colonies of Englishmen in all quarters of the globe. All men trade with all men when mutually convenient, and are even bound to do it by the maker of men. Our friends of China, who guiltily refused to trade in these circumstances, had we not to argue with them in cannon shot at last, and convince them that they ought to trade? Hostile tariffs will arise to shut us out, and then again will fall to let us in. But the sons of England, speakers of the English language were it nothing more, will in all times have the ineradicable predisposition to trade with England. Mickley was the Panionian rendezvous of all the tribes of Ion for old Greece. Why should not London long continue the all-Saxon home, rendezvous of all the children of the Harzrock, arriving in select samples from the Antipodes and elsewhere by steam and otherwise to the season here? What a future! Wide is the world, if we have the heart and heroism for it, which by heaven's blessing we shall. Keep not standing fixed and rooted, briskly venture, briskly roam, head and hand wherever thou foot it, and stout heart are still at home. In what land the sun does visit, brisk are we, whate'er betide. To give space for wandering is it, that the world was made so wide? Fourteen hundred years ago it was a considerable emigration service, never doubted, by much enlistment, discussion, and apparatus that we ourselves arrived in this remarkable island and got into our present difficulties among others. Past and Present, pages 228-230 through 230. The main substance of this immense problem of organizing labor, and first of all of managing the working classes, will, it is very clear, have to be solved by those who stand practically in the middle of it, by those who themselves work and preside over work. Of all that can be enacted by any parliament in regard to it, the germs must already lie potentially extant in those two classes who are to obey such enactment. A human chaos in which there is no light, you vainly attempt to irradiate by lights shed on it. Order never can arise there. Past and present, pages 231 through 232. Look around you. Your world hosts are all in mutiny, in confusion, destitution, on the eve of fiery wreck and madness. They will not march farther for you on the sixpence-a-day and supply-and-demand principle. They will not, nor ought they, nor can they. Ye shall reduce them to order. Begin reducing them to order, to just subordination, noble loyalty in return for noble guidance. Their souls are driven nigh mad. Let yours be sane and ever saner not as a bewildered, bewildering mob, but as a firm regimented mass, with real captains over them, will these men march any more. All human interests, 
combined human endeavors and social growth in this world have at a certain stage of their development required organizing and work the grandest of human interests does not require it god knows the task will be hard but no noble task was ever easy this task will wear away your lives and the lives of your sons and grandsons but for what purpose if not for tasks like this were lives given to men ye shall cease to count your thousand pound scalps the noble of you shall cease nay the very scalps as i say will not long be left if you count only these ye shall cease wholly to be barbarous vulturous cactaws and become noble european nineteenth-century men ye shall know that mammon in never such gigs and flunky respectabilities in not the alone god that of himself he is but a devil and even a brute god difficult yes it will be difficult the short fiber cotton that too was difficult the waste cotton shrub long useless disobedient as the thistle by the wayside have ye not conquered it made it into beautiful bandana webs white woven shirts for men bright tinted air garments wherein flit goddesses ye have shivered mountains asunder made the hard iron pliant to you as soft putty the forest giants marsh jatoons bear sheaves of golden grain Aegir, the sea demon himself stretches his back for a sleek highway to you and on fire horses and wind horses ye career ye are most strong thor red-bearded with his blue sun eyes with his cheery heart and strong thunder hammer he and you have prevailed ye are most strong ye sons of the icy north of the far east far marching from your rugged eastern wilderness hitherward from the gray dawn of time ye are sons of the jatun land the land of difficulties conquered difficult you must try this thing once try it with the understanding that it will and shall have to be done try it as ye try the paltier thing making of money i will bet on you once more against all jatuns tailor gods double-barreled lawwards and denizens of chaos whatsoever past and present pages two thirty six and two thirty seven a question arises here whether in some ulterior perhaps not far distant stage of this chivalry of labor your master worker may not find it possible and needful to grant his workers permanent interest in his enterprise and theirs so that it become in practical result what in essential fact and justice it ever is a joint enterprise all men from the chief master down to the lowest overseer and operative economically as well as loyally concerned for it which question i do not answer the answer near or else far is perhaps yes and yet one knows the difficulties despotism is essential in most enterprises i am told they do not tolerate freedom of debate on board a seventy four republican senate and plebiscite would not answer well in cotton mills and yet observe there too freedom not nomads or apes freedom but man's freedom this is indispensable we must have it and will have it to reconcile despotism with freedom well is that such a mystery do you not already know the way it is to make your despotism just rigorous as destiny but just too as destiny and its laws the laws of god all men obey these and have no freedom at all but in obeying them the way is already known part of the way and courage and some qualities are needed for walking on it past and present pages two forty one two forty two not a may game is this man's life but a battle and a march a warfare with principalities and powers 
no idle promenade through fragrant orange groves and green flowery spaces waited on by the coral muses in the rosy hours it is a stern pilgrimage through burning sandy solitudes through regions of thick ribbed ice he walks among men loves men with inexpressible soft pity as they cannot love him but his soul dwells in solitude in the uttermost parts of creation in green oases by the palm tree wells he rests a space but anon he has to journey forward escorted by the terrors and the splendors the archdemons and archangels all heaven and all pandemonium are his escort the stars keen glancing from the immensities send tidings to him the graves silent with their dead from the eternities deep calls for him unto deep past and present page two forty nine end of section forty five recording by tom hirsch section forty six the catholic church and the social question this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Tom Hirsch. The Reverend Dr. Berry read a paper at the Catholic Conference on June 30th, 1890, from which I take the following extracts as illustrative of the rising feeling of this subject in the Catholic Church. The Reverend Dr. Berry began by defining the proletariat as those who have only one possession, their labor. Those who have no land and no stake in the land, no house, and no home except the few sticks of furniture they significantly call by the name, no right to employment, but at the most a right to poor relief, and who until the last twenty years had not even a right to be educated, unless by the charity of their betters. The class which, without figure of speech or flights of rhetoric, is homeless landless, propertyless, in our chief cities, that I called the proletariat. Of the proletariat, he declared there were hundreds of thousands growing up outside the pale of all churches. He continued, for it is frightfully evident that Christianity has not kept pace with the population, that it has lagged terribly behind, that in plain words, we have in our midst a nation of heathens to whom the ideals, the practices, and the commandments of religion are things unknown, as little realized in the miles on miles of tenement houses and the factories which have produced them as though Christ had never lived or never died. How could it be otherwise? The great mass of men and women have never had time for religion. You cannot expect them to work double tides, with hard physical labor from morning till night in the surroundings we know and see how much mind and leisure is left for higher things on six days of the week. We must look this matter in the face. I do not pretend to establish the proportion between different sections in which these things happen. Still less am I willing to lay the blame on those who are houseless, landless, and propertyless. What I say is that if the government of a country allows millions of human beings to be thrown into such conditions of living and working as we have seen, these are the consequences that must be looked for. A child, said the Anglican Bishop South, has a right to be born and not to be damned into the world. Here have been millions of children literally damned into the world, neither their heads nor their hands trained for anything useful, their miserable subsistence a thing to be fought and scrambled for, their homes reeking dens under the law of leaseholding which has produced outcast London and horrible Glasgow, their right to a playground and amusement curtailed to the running gutter, and their great object lesson in life, the drunken parents, who end so often in the prison, the hospital, and the workhouse. We need not be astonished if these not only are not 
Christians, but have never understood why they should be. The social condition has created this domestic heathenism, then the social condition must be changed. We stand in need of a public creed, of a social and, if you will understand the word, of a lay Christianity. This work cannot be done by the clergy, nor within the four walls of a church. The field of battle lies in the school, the home, the street, the tavern, the market, and wherever men come together. To make the people Christian, they must be restored to their homes, and their homes to them. End of section 46 End of In Darkest England and the Way Out by William Booth Recording by Tom Hirsch